Latina Society, nothing but facts live stream. Today, we are embarking on the story of the Western Crusades. Uh, we began talking about the by talking about the Eastern Crusades, and we covered uh, the really two important phases. There were three phases, but two of them are really important, and that was the rule of Nur al-Din and then the rule of Salah al-Din, uh, Yusuf ibn Ayyub. These, are the, these were the important phases of the uh, Crusades of the East. Now, there were many other Crusades in the East, but these Crusades were, were just like losses. They were just like nothing worth talking about. There were up to 13 Crusades, believe it or not, in, the, in those countries, in that area. But after, beyond the first one was the only one that the Christians really... They really uh, won handily and, and easily. And they were very, they were the, afterwards, Nur al-Din and then Salah al-Din took over the rest of the history. Well, today we talk about the other uh, group of people who despise us and uh, have, at least historically, we could say, uh, been the enemies of Muslims, and that is uh, the Spanish. Uh, and the, the Christians of Spain were hardcore crusaders, and the, they basically, like, they're all, you know, one people. This is, one is in the east and one is in the west. That's the only difference. So the Christians of Spain were fighting to take back Andalus. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised up the sincere and the pious when, when, when he saw that the uh, Spanish, uh, the Andalusian Muslims had lost their way. The Umayyad Empire had collapsed. And then the next, the uh, phase of Andalusian history is really bad. It's called the Party Kings, the era of the Party Kings. Uh, Muluk al-Tawa'if. Muluk al-Tawa'if were just basically every city was on its own. Was its own little kingdom. And he, they, they did not behave with any cohesion with each other anymore. So this was a big problem, and this was a way, in, very quick inroad by which the Christians started taking cities. Little villages at a time, cities at a time, pit, pitting one Muslim against the other. And as Qurtubi relates that uh, he lived in, uh, uh, the, in a time in which it spills into his tafsir, where he says that he speaks about jihad, and he speaks about his own people, and he speaks about how they how do they expect to have any success after being drowning in sins. So at this time, the time that we're going to hone into is the past 1,000 of the Common Era, right? Just around the 1,000 mark of the Common Era, and we're talking between the 400s and 500s of Islamic history. Okay. Now, who's alive at this time? At this time, Imam al-Ghazali is alive. Right. The, the time period, just so you have an idea. Imam al-Ghazali is alive at this time period, and he will have a role in what I guess it's going to be part two of what we're going to talk about. So today we're going to have a brief uh, um, a, a discussion on the foundation of the defense against the Western Crusades, because the Western Crusades, as you're going to see, it does have an initial success, but then it's repelled. All right. And these crusades are not numbered like the Eastern Crusades, like the First Crusade, the Second Crusade. They, they don't really number them in the Western Islamic history. But we're going to zoom in on a, a tribe called the Sinhaja, because this is a, the Sinhaja are a people from the lands that is between Mauritania and Mali. Okay. So the, they, these people are deep into West Africa. So from Morocco, you go deep down and you get to the Sinhaja. And there is a man by the name of Yahya ibn Ibrahim. Right, this person you should know. His name is Yahya ibn Ibrahim. He was the chief of the Gudala tribe, the sub-tribe. Right, they were the Gudala tribe. Now these people, okay, they were in Islam and surrounding them were the old pagans. So it's not like what you imagine today where you go to West Africa and you see all these Muslims. No, this was just the edge, the far edge of where Islam had reached into the, in West Africa. 
So you go, of course, you have Morocco. But what the more south you go into Mauritania and less and down even more, okay, you start to that that's it. And so there are some Muslim tribes there, but they're surrounded by paganism. And Yahya ibn Ibrahim, he feared that if we don't get educate our people quickly, the next generation could fall back into the old animism that they're in, that we're surrounded with. So what does he do? He goes up, up north, and he goes to the Dar al-Murabitin, what's called. Dar al-Murabitin is essentially the, the Murabit and the Ribat. What are these terms? The Ribat is a place where people defend the city. That's essentially what the idea of the Ribat is. It's a place where you defend the city. There are castles and citadels. These castles and citadels in peacetime turned into colleges. So the ribats became a term that started off as a citadel in which soldiers study, uh, soldiers get ready for war and look out and they walk across the citadel watching for the enemy. Well, 99% of the time, there's nothing to do. There's no enemy. There's nothing to warn against. So you can't keep practicing swordsmanship and bow and, ar- bow and arrow and riding horses all day. So what did they end up doing? They started studying the deen. Started studying. So if you study 99% of the time and you only have to worry about fighting less than 1% of the time, the, the, the ribat became a college. That's how the word came about uh, of a ribat. And... It was one of the greatest feats in Islamic history when that, it was still merged a little bit that they were soldiers in the martial arts, meaning the arts of war, but they were also fuqaha and hafad of Qur'an. Because once that knowledge came into the soldiers and they started studying, the soldiers started to transform. So the word ribat took its origin from that. So a murabit is someone who's on that. And that phrase, murabit, is an ancient phrase. It's from all the way back, uh, over a thousand years, that anybody who's in these castles studying. So murabit literally became a term for sheikh. Whereas before, murabit meant a warrior who's looking out for the enemy. So Yusuf, uh, uh, Yahya ibn Ibrahim, this, this tribal chief, he's worried about his people. He goes up to the murabitin, and he asked them for a sheikh. That's what he does. And this decision of his is going to reap so much benefit, you can't imagine. You can't imagine what this one decision, what it does. So when he gets there, all right, he, from the Gudala, uh, Gudala chief, Yahya ibn Ibrahim, comes to the Ribat, and he asks, and he finds that the, the sheikh, his name is Waggag ibn Zallu. He chooses Abdullah ibn Yasin, a man by the name of Abdullah ibn Yasin. Abdullah ibn Yasin, you cannot imagine the, what, he does not know what he's about to spark. He does not realize what he's about to spark. He's about to spark without knowing it. He's about to get the ball in motion for a 100-year dynasty that is going to eventually conquer from the south of Mauritania, Mali, Senegal, south Mauritania, all the way up to Morocco, all the way up to Andalus. Abdullah ibn Yasin's students will do this. He has no clue. He's in a city of learning. He's in the center and with the city and everything. And this area that they want to call is called Al-Adrar. Al-Adrar is a big area. It spans from Mauritania to Algeria. And that's where he's sent. And it's really interesting. I really wish to know what was being thought in his mind when he was being sent there. Imagine somebody sends you out today to hey Rai we need to send you out you're going to Arkansas you're going to do Dawah in Arkansas that's essentially what's going on 
because he's in the center of learning, a center of knowledge, and he's being sent far down west, southwest. But he goes. And what is his knowledge? He is documented as being a Sunni Maliki Ash'ari scholar. And he goes down to the people there, and they're Lemtuna. The tribe there is called the Lemtuna. And he gets there, and he, he notices first thing that happens is a revolt. There's like a war, a civil war, right? And Yahya ibn Umar, he's the leader, he's the Gudala chief, but he's the leader of the Lamtuna. In general, this, 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 this uh, so there's a revolt, and he sees wars, he sees fighting, okay? And Ibn Yasin realizes that he has to do a little bit more than teaching because this place is out of control. So he forms an alliance, right, from his students and from the other tribes around him to defend the city that they're going to live in, okay? And they respect him. They have a lot of respect for him, okay? And so the way that they view, they do it is that he declares that the way that we're going to do this, we bring all these tribes together, they wouldn't agree with each other, but I'm a foreigner, I'm a stranger, they'll agree to me. So they agreed that he would be the sheikh, but they would choose a leader from amongst themselves. That would be the one leader. So he unified some sub-tribes here, some smaller tribes, and they founded this group that would defend their area to live in, in which they're going to live, okay? And he's their sheikh. So he became a source of unity for them, just as the Prophet ﷺ came to people in Medina who were fighting each other. But because he was from outside and from an area that they respected, because they were from a part of Arabia that they respected, they were able to submit to him. And he unified them. So he... Abdullah ibn Yasin does the same thing. He comes in, he says, I'll be the sheikh. We'll all have to participate in defending our territory. And you pick, and they chose a man by the name of Yahya ibn Umar. So that's Yahya ibn Ibrahim is one person. Yahya ibn Umar is another person. Okay. And Yahya ibn Umar took military command. They became very good uh, at defending their territory. And Abdullah ibn Yasin became a very good da'i to them. And the first thing he did was that he stopped all drinking. There was wine, and they, were, they would drink at night, and they would dance and sing. Well, what do you think drinking and dancing and singing all together leads to? They're not doing this with segregation. It leads to zina, Right? This is an age-old formula of Iblis. Drugs, music, right? It, and zina, it's always a package. You never separate. If you bring drugs and you bring music, Iblis is at the wheel. Zina's coming next, right? It's guaranteed, all right? So he notices that that's part of the culture. He wages a war on wine. And he, he now has, he didn't know he was walking into this, Right? But he was someone Allah chose because he has a quick wit. And he realized the first thing when he got there, there was like a, a rebellion and, a, and, and an attack on us. We have to, number one, unify. Bring everyone together. You don't agree on things, I'll be the judge. I'm a foreigner. I have no relatives here. I have nobody that I'm biased to. So Abdullah ibn Yasin becomes the sheikh. And they select the military commander, that is Yahya ibn Umar. And they have, he has his sub-generals. And Abdullah ibn Yasin becomes, he starts to clean up shop. He said, we're only going to get victory by obeying Allah Ta'ala. So he starts banning wine. He starts teaching, preaching, fiery preaches, bringing up. Now you have, all of a sudden, you have these soldiers who are like having taqwa, studying the Quran, studying fiqh, all right? And, and acting upon it, praying in the night. Okay. So what happens? He continues, and one thing they realized is that the next town over is called Sijil Masa. 
Next town over is called Sijin Mesa. And they sort of, a lot of people there liked what they saw. They liked what they saw was going on over there with the Lum Tuna. So he said, well, let's expand. And that was their first, the concept came that, all right, we did so well here, but wait a second, we can expand. So they expanded and they took over the first city. Okay. First over, uh, took over the first city. And then, so he went on. Then they went up north more and conquered Sus, which is a region of South Morocco. They didn't expect any of this. All they wanted to do was defend their own city, but they got so successful because of the message of taqwa had now the soldiers, they listened to their general. The generals te- treat the soldiers well. And of course, on top of all that, they're getting tawfiq from Allah Ta'ala in, in, in their success. Okay. And, it, and Ibn Yasin got involved directly now with strategy. He wasn't just like, today what you understand, just the faqih, sit, zip your mouth, don't do anything, just give the fatwa and that's it. Go back to your seat. No, go back to your little masjid and sit in a hole over there. No, that's how it is. That's the imagination that people have now. If you're a sheikh, all we want you to do is have to make, have no agenda except teach the religion and go back home. Let us tell, deal with the world. Let us do everything. That wasn't how it was in the old days. In all in the old days, in the ancient times. No, shiuch got involved. He was a sheikh. He was the strategist right there and he was a fighter. He fought. He fought with them. And he was directly involved in subject, subjugating the Baragawata, another group, right? These were on the Atlantic coast, okay? And he died in that fight. So their sheikh died. But their sheikh, he died in 1059, okay? He had only spent about 13 years with them. 13 years and he, he transformed them in okay he transformed them in many ways and he set this thing in motion he only lived with them 13 years he died in this battle okay all right he was then replaced by Suleiman ibn Haddu Suleiman ibn Haddu was the the sheikh in his place he got killed he got killed but he was not replaced. So what happens is the um, Yahya ibn Omar stayed, the, became the Khalifa and the spiritual guide in one person. All right, the Khalifa and the spiritual guide, all right, in one person. So there is on maps in Morocco, you could find Sidi Abdullah. What the, who Sidi Abdullah in maps in Morocco is Abdullah ibn Yasin. This person is so important. Okay, he's a a scholar who is assigned to go teach a people. That's it. That's all it was. It wasn't anything more than that. Yet when he got there, he got startled that there's an attack on the city, and he finds himself that the people listen to him. They, 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 they like what he's saying and what he's teaching and they unify around him. They protect the area. He transformed just, it's almost, it feels like it's Medina all over again, right? That model where a sheikh comes in, cleans up and we're at war. But outside of war, he's training us, he's teaching us, he's guiding us. And they become so good at what they do, they start expanding. So he dies having taken over a couple of cities, and now the next group, the, the next generation, all right, Yahya ibn Omar and Abu Bakr ibn Omar, the two brothers, they are the serious disciples. Abdullah ibn Omar, although he was the, uh, oh, sorry, Yahya ibn Omar, he was... The military general, he was also a very, very close disciple of Abdullah ibn Yasin. Very close disciple. He now, okay, and his brother 
are in charge. Now, Yahya ibn Omar dies. Okay. Yahya ibn Omar dies. He dies how? Fighting. All right. Next, his brother Abu Bakr ibn Omar takes over. When Abu Bakr ibn Omar takes over, okay, he too, eventually, they expanding, he too is killed. Okay. He too gets killed. However, however, he just finds before he's killed and before things move on, all right, he finds that his nephew, Yusuf, Ibn Tashfin, is extremely capable. All right, he's extremely capable. And he starts now to hand him a region. He handed him the north to do what? To, to monitor it, to, to, to rule it in his absence. Okay. Or, sorry, while he's fighting in the south. He had, there are some revolts now. He's fighting in the south, some revolts. Yusuf ibn Tashfin, his nephew, is given a job of just, just govern. That's it. Nothing else. Well, Yusuf ibn Tashfin, okay, he's young, he comes up and he starts to arrange the city in such a way that when his uncle comes up again, Abu Bakr ibn Omar, he's stunned. This is amazing, right? The military is organized. The, the finances are organized. Everything's organized. So what does he do? He realizes, I'm older, I'm tired of this, All right? I got business down, I have to quell these revolts. He literally gives him the reins and he gives Yusuf ibn Tashfin the rule. And he simply says, just treat me like one of your generals. I'm going down south, okay? And I'm going to, to fight the revolt. And he does. And Yusuf ibn Tashfin becomes king. So what does he do? Yusuf ibn Tashfin was more qualified, more competent, and as pious as anybody else. So he began strategizing, and he began, begins taking over all of Morocco. This was unthinkable only 20 years earlier. Unthinkable that these, this tribe who have the civil wars and all this fighting would do anything like this. But because they transform themselves with Islam, they completely transform themselves by the teachings of Abdullah bin Yasin, who Sheikh Waggag ibn Zalu trusted him. So we have to look at who is Waggag, who trained Abdullah bin Yasin. And Yahya ibn Umar and Abu Bakr ibn Umar, people who were able to pass on ruler leadership, disciples of Abdullah bin Yasin, who loved the vision more than they loved anything else. Okay? They didn't love power for themselves. As test the testimony being, they gave it away when it was needed. And they gave away, they gave it to Yusuf bin Tashfin when it was needed. So these were blessed people. You don't do this stuff unless you have a belief. Right? Nobody does this stuff unless you have some kind of a belief. Right? A, a bigger picture. Yusuf ibn Tashfin, he becomes an emir and a king. And he began, begins taking over everything. He realizes through, through our world, their world at that time, it's in chaos. We got to just take it all over. Because they, they don't, people don't know what's good for them anymore. Okay? He was an effective general and strategist. Okay? And he brought many troops over to work for him. To join him in this. And they began conquering the mountain, er the, mo the mountain areas and taking these people with them until they could conquer the biggest, the prize, the crown. What is the crown? The city of Fez. There's no doubt about it. And he takes the city of Fez easily. 
Then he takes the city of uh, Atanja, so on his Tangiers. And then he takes Tilmisan, which is now actually in uh, Algeria. And then he goes all the way up. And by 1083, we're now talking like four, 37 years after Abdullah ibn Yasin has come. 37 years. This is not a long time. But you see, when transformation of the heart is sound and effective, the transformation is quick. 37 years, he goes up to Sayyuta. What is Sayyuta? It's Septa. The Arabs call it Septa. It's, a, it's between Morocco and Spain. Once he took that over, now the Spanish Muslims start they're really paying attention now. And their munafiqeen are worried because they want wealth. They don't want these burbs. They have no respect for these poor people. Because the, these Lamtuna from South Mauritania or Mali, that border area. Can you get us a map of Africa? West Africa? They have no respect for them. Yeah, let's get a West African map. Uh, we could put it up there for where's Mauritania and Mali and all those areas. Yeah, that's good. You see that? What's what's the the south? What do, the south border of Mauritania? That's where they're from. Okay. He captures Fez, then Tangiers, then Tilmisan, then Ceuta, then the capital, what is now Algiers, capital of Algeria today. So many cities. Okay. And they need he needs to make a capital, so he founds the city of Marrakesh. The city of Marrakesh becomes his capital. So Marrakesh is the city that came about after the rise of the Murabitun. The group they called themselves Al Murabitun. Because that's where they found Abdullah bin Yasin to be part of, part of the Murabitun. So he, they joined the Murabitun. You guys hear that on the stream? That must have been a motorcycle or something that went really uh, loud. Yeah, Honda. Yeah, (laughs) souped up. All right, now listen up. After all that conquest of Morocco, well, guess what happens? In the year 1091, okay, a Abbasid connected king of Spain, specifically the southern city of Seville. Okay. Now, the Abbasid had someone there. The Umayyads didn't like that. All sorts of political nonsense is going on. Well, in the meantime, King Alfonso the Sixth. all the Alfonsos, there's ten Alfonsos, they, they are the biggest crusaders. There are ten Alfonsos in a row. I don't know if they name that, or, or you, as soon as you become the, uh, the, their king... You take on the name Alfonso. Okay. Well, this Castilian king, Alfonso, starts taking over many cities, such as Toledo, which is what do we call now Toledo. Toledo, like Toledo, Ohio. It's named after Toledo, Spain. The Christ, the, it was a great city under Islam. And this guy... This king, Alfonso, takes it over. So what do they do? Who do they call? They call Yusuf ibn Tashfin. They say, hey, you, you're the one with a competent army. You're the one who knows how to fight. You come and push them back. Okay? Some people, all right, his son included, said, no, 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 no. Don't call Yusuf ibn Tashfin. Right? Don't call Yusuf ibn Tashfin. He'll come and he'll take over and he won't leave. You'll be without a city. His father says, I'm not going to be the one, okay, who lost 
to the Christians. That's not going to be my legacy. The one who lost to the Christians, right? And then be cursed and spat on by every Muslim thereafter. I'd rather have these camel drivers from Africa rule over us than lose to the Christians. Because at least they're Muslims. See, you see, they're calling them as Muslims, but they have no respect for them. Culturally speaking, they have no respect. You have to understand, the Andalusians had a very, very, very elite culture. Very elite culture. And they didn't have much respect for these shepherds and these camel drivers. And that's what they do in West Africa. They deal with camels. So, Yusuf ibn Tashfin goes up. He arrives in Andalusia. And he had looks there and he sees that these people drink. These, the, the, these people, the women, you don't know who's married to who because of the women that are in the court and the way they act. Okay? And he came over to free the Muslims from the Christians and he realizes you people... You tax your people. You do everything wrong. Unlawful taxes. He's disgusted by them. He's ex- disgusted. They, the kings, the emirs of Seville, Almira, Granada, they're extremely extravagant. Over the top extravagance. Not just in the halal, with the haram too. Okay? And they have accepted, they have accepted to pay tribute to Christian kings as long as the Christians leave them alone to enjoy their lives. Yusuf ibn Tashfin saw a complete disaster and he felt that a complete overhaul is due. Okay? And he felt that he should, should arrest all of these emirs and all these kings, all right, and, and take over the whole place. However, he knows that this is not his, he was not asked to do this. It would be haram for him to do this, in his view at that point. So all he's going to do is he's going to fight, and he's going to go back. Okay. They're not trying to conquer anything from the Christians. They're, ser- they're merely trying to neutralize the Reconquista, which is what the Crusaders are called. So the Crusaders, they're called Crusaders in the East, or it's the Reco- it's Crusades in the East, the Reconquista in the West. Okay? That's all he wants to do. And he did, with the exception of uh, uh, including one of the biggest fights was Valencia. Valencia, Spain is one of the biggest fights that he had. There was a very weak emir for the Muslims, and he had agreed to pay tribute to the, to the Christians. Who was ruling the Christians at that time? The famous El Cid. Ryan, do you ever hear of El Cid? Okay. So El Cid is a Christian crusader. All right, fighting Muslims in Spain. Valencia was very difficult. Okay. But even though they smashed everybody. Yusuf bin Tashfin, they smashed everybody. Okay. Everyone was smashed. They did so well there okay but they could not get through el cid that's why el cid read us his bio rodrigo diaz de vivar a christian knight okay a warlord of medieval spain fighting the muslim armies okay he earned the so he did actually um fight at sometimes with Muslims. I don't know how, we'll see how that happened. And the Muslims are the one who gave him, the Arabs gave him a seed, which means the chief. Okay? So that's what it, that's what it seems like. Yeah. Christians themselves were not um, unified. A village near the city of Burgos as the head of the loyal king, knights, he came to dominate uh, the, uh, the high part, the Levant's part of the Iberian Peninsula. He reclaimed uh, Valencia from Moorish control. He took it from the Arabs for a brief period during the Reconquista, right? ruling as the prince of Valencia. Until 1094, uh, from, or from 1094 to 1099, then he died. 
and his wife inherited and became queen until 1102. And it was recon uh, conquered by the Moors, which is by Yusuf ibn Tashfin. So that's the story of the famous El Cid. And he ends up somehow in literature, right? El Cid ends up in literature and becomes like a name that's very famous. Okay. So they take from him, Yusuf ibn Tashfin fights him and is not able to defeat El Cid right away. It takes, he's not going to defeat him this time. El Cid maintains the control, control over Valencia. Okay. And Yusuf ibn Tashfin now seeing that things are mopped up, he goes back. He goes back to Morocco, and he rules from Marrakesh. Now what's going to happen? We're going to see. A couple years later, the Muslims are so extravagant, so sinful, they collapse again. They collapse again into even worse of a situation. And that's where we're going to get the detailed next See, just as last time we did an overview, but then we zoomed in on the actual conquest of Jerusalem. So likewise, we're going to look at how Yusuf ibn Tashfin actually ends up conquering, and this time with a fatwa to take over the whole place from Abu Hamd al-Ghazali and at tusi And he, with that fatwa, he takes over the whole place and he creates the Murabit dynasty. Al Murabitun, known in Arabic as the Al Muravids. The Al Muravids. Did El Sid accept Islam? Ryan, you could tell us that. While I open up YouTube and Instagram to start. What do we got, right? Did El Cid become a Muslim? Aida K is here. AM63 is here. No mention of El Cid accepting Islam. with the Christians. Lays of you Muslim. All right, Ryan, read me questions while I fire up my YouTube. Who? Who's Ryan Hillard? Oh, he's one of our guys? Oh, okay, nice. MashaAllah. Yes, nice. Now, Granada, the Alhambra, represents the last stand. That's what Granada represents. The last stand. Okay. And Granada is the place, is the, at the southern tip of Andalus. And this is way after maybe about, well, 300, 400 years after the Murabitun. So the Murabitun rule, they're going to be replaced by the Muwahidun. Then there's going to be other kingdoms. But eventually, city by city, the Reconquista will succeed, unlike the East where it failed. The Reconquista will succeed eventually. Um, this is the first wave of the Reconquista. Murabitun push it back. There's a second wave, Muahidun push it back. There are a couple other waves, but eventually all these cities are conquered. All the Muslims make Hijrah to Granada. They all live in Granada. It becomes the last Muslim city. It's a really sad time. But the scholars all said, it's because of your sinfulness. Right? You only, you're only suffering all these defeats because of your sinfulness. Nothing more, nothing less. And that's what happened with these uh, 
That's what happened with these, uh, these people. Because of their sinfulness, the Christians were taken over. And the Andalusian Muslims were... If you read the details of what happened to the Andalusian Muslims, like what, how did they behave, you would honestly say, honestly, they deserve nothing more than to be conquered. These people are so uh, duplicitous. Their priorities are so off that you literally you would say that they deserve to be conquered. That's what you would say. Does he say these are the same spirits that we're reading right no, now? No, no, no. Okay. My own notes, yeah. Um, I, think Bec- he, I think he wrote a chapter on it earlier, or no? Uh, I didn't see one. Chapter on Yusuf and Tishri. Maybe in the second volume. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, not the one that I have. Probably the second one. How is the films? You can bring in Q&A. Using a system like Crowdcast would capture and manage comments from everywhere. Interesting. Adnan Oday. Is he the brother of Kareem? No, no, this is his brother. Comes Different person. Mm. Oh, Adnan. That Adnan, yeah, yeah. Are you going to Mist? You don't go to Mist anymore? Okay. Uh, Ibrahim, oh, Mist is for high school, that's why. I've never been there, no. Oh, okay, it's for Muslim high schools. Ibrahim Khan, a cappella is halal, yes. Yeah, Reconquista, well, I see a Q there, so I'm going to say Reconquista. <laughs> but it's the Reconquista, yeah. Then put a K there. Uh... Thoughts on the current Murabitun movement started by Ian Dallas. Is it even alive? I did meet them. I found them to be a bit cold to non murabit types. I don't know. I felt like, did, did you meet them? Yes. So me and Sahib uh, went to the masjid. Yeah. We were for Fajr one day. And we were sitting there. And there's only one brother there. I uh, see Yusuf. And like, it was nice. We prayed in Maliki prayer at least. Yeah. And they read the his too. Yeah, yeah, we read all that, and we talked to him until like probably eight a.m. or something. He's really good, really good guy. I think he's the imam of the masjid. Yeah. But um, he said that that weekend, basically everybody, there was a conference for like twentieth anniversary or something, and all the people were around. So we actually saw, I think it's Abdul Rahman Biri or no Abdul uh, Haq. Abdul Haq Biri. So we saw him, but we didn't like talk or anything. So they, I think they were. Uh, obviously very well organized, right? They achieved a lot in Spain. They did a lot of dawah. Yeah. They had some dramas in the beginning in England. Okay. How do you become more confident people on the earth? I have a very simple uh, thing about that. Okay. Confidence is not in yourself. It's in your ability. So if you want to be confident, get good at something. That's how simple it is. If you want to be a confident person, get good at something. Be good at something. All right, that's that's what confidence is all about. So get so and you can't get good at something you don't practice it. So practice over and over and over. Get good. Put effort. Wake up. Okay. Sometimes you have to go deep in the night. All right. Then get up early next morning. So you got to work hard and at something. Then you you're confident in that. And then once you have successes, then it merges with yourself because that becomes an attribute of yourself. Those six, that success becomes your your personal attribute. Chavez, there are some who claim the Murabitun were ethery because one ruler burned Ghazali's books. No. Abdullah bin Yasin was an Ashari and the Murabitun were Asha'ira. But what happened was that they did not accept Ghazali's works on the tasawwufi elements, not the aqidah elements. How when Qadi Ayyad was one of their biggest scholars in that time. And after them came Qadi Ayyad. Um, in Norwich, England, or some as some people call it, Norwich, England, but there's a W, so I think it's Norwich, England. The Murabitun. Now, there's no direct connection. I think he just named the group Murabitun. 
And that is part of our, like, British Islamic history, I think. I think it's because the Talib is from uh, uh, Morocco. Morocco, yeah. Because they took um, from Sidi Muhammad ibn Habib. And Ian Dallas is the one who brought those Qasidas back into the West. He's the one who brought them into the West. And under him at some point were Muhsin al-Najjar, Hamza Yusuf, Dr. Omar Farooq Abdullah, Ian uh, Abdul Latif Whiteman, the famous designer, Peter Sanders, the photographer, and a lot of other people. They were part of that all at once at one point. So he clearly did something right, right? And then he went to Mexico for a while. Then he went to... to South Africa, and he has a big center in Spain, so he's clearly doing something right. Okay, yeah, we started the QA. Ibrahim Khan is, when are we going to do the Mughal Empire? So yeah, so we went west, we're going to finish the west, then we'll go east. Pretty much. Crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. East and West. Um, Baha'i B says it's Norwich. What is up with the British putting so many silent letters in their language? <laughs> Leicester. Spelled Leicester, but it's Leicester. Right? Read me the Insta questions, if you can. Yeah. And I'll do the YouTube. Is the Ba'adwi connected to the Shadiliya? There are some awrad that they did. They do take Hizb al-Bahr. But it's, it has its own senate through its own family line, and it has a senate through Abu Madian from Morocco. A teacup with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We don't put a teacup with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim only if it's like an adornment, Then, but no. You can't drink from it for sure. And you can't, because are you going to put it in the dishwasher? Are you going to wash it? No. It's not the way to put the name of Allah. Somewhere there. Uga Panda, how does Algeria and Libya exist if you want to expand? Ryan Hiller says, oh, the French are worse, right? Yeah, they are, in terms of uh, the French language, in terms of silent letters, right? Said Muhammad Daniel says, I heard that part of the misguided misguidance that afflicted Andalus was that they sought very deep knowledge like being able to know when someone would die based on the birthday only and many other types. Do you know about this? But I don't know about that, no. But what I came across in the books is that they went down because of luxury. They loved their luxury. They loved their dunya. And that was their downfall. The dunya was their downfall. Okay, Abdullah U.S., not sure you commented on my question yesterday, so put it again, please. Abdullah U.S., put your question again. Sophia says, well, we have to do go north and do the Seljuks. Yes, so you got to go. We started with Philistine. Then we're going to go west to cover the Reconquista. Then we're going to go east, we got to cover the Mughals. But before the Mughals, the Seljuks. Okay, because they did a lot and they have some serious heroes they have some serious battles there right in their history which silsila and which uh, uh, your mentor and sheikh that is al habib omar from yemen Recommended material on Yusuf ibn Tashfin of the Murabitun. I only have Arabic books. How did people uh, of the, the aforetimes knew angels existed? They claimed angels were daughters of God. The Quraysh, they did have a concept. They did have the teachings of Sayyidina Ibrahim. They had that, except it was altered and corrupted. So the concept of angels is an ancient concept that started uh, 
with the origin the, the the Muslims of the f- the flood knew it. So after the flood, they spread that to their people. So people, the concept continued even if they fell into paganism. Same with Quraysh. The concept that there is something called uh, there are some these things called angels. That concept existed, always existed. Because it's uh, what, as the Prophet said, him said the remnant teachings of the prophets. All right, Levan Brown says, what about the Aglabid Empire? Also the different Kharaji nations, such as the Sufri and the Nejda in North Africa. North Africa has had a lot. They've had Kharajites. They've had Shiites. They've had the Fatimids, who are the Batanis. Today's, they're known as the um, Bahori Ismaili sect. So the Ismailis divided into two types. Even the, at the time, they had their, the general uh, Ismailis, which were the Fatimids. But they also had the assassins, who were a bit w- wacky and crazy, like extremists. And today they have the Bahor uh, Ismailis, and they have another group, um, their name skips my mind, that other group, Nizaris. The Nizari Ismailis, they're treated, they're considered not Muslim because they, den- they deny things that are known in religion by necessity, like the requirement to make Hajj. They say Hajj, the purpose of Hajj was to see the Prophet ﷺ. Therefore, when the Prophet is not there, then the Hajj is to see the Imam. Hajj, therefore, is to go visit the Aga Khan. You have to go spend your money after having already given him 10% of your income. Spend your money and go honor the Aga Khan and one of his European wives. Because he's, look at his biography, this is all, it seems that they do. They have a nice charity, okay, non-profit organization, so they don't get taxed and marrying different American and European wives and getting divorced six years later, she realizes she's got into some kind of a scam and they divorce constantly. I'm sorry if, if it sounds disrespectful to the Ismailis, the Nizaris specifically, but it's very hard for me to have respect. I'm not perfect. I'm not very strong. I found it very difficult to have respect for this belief, right? No prayer, no salah, no hajj, no uh, whatever. Pay your zakat to the guy. The guy's on a jet ski, all right, uh, skiing around and having yachts, drinking probably. I think I saw a picture of him with a champagne glass and you want me to have respect for this. I'm sorry, it's very hard for me. Thoughts on Ibn Qayyim's Madarij al an excellent book, an excellent book. Summary, it's like a summary of Ahiyya al Madin almost. Can you pay someone to do hajj for a deceased family member? You can make the intention that the, the payment is for the journey. Okay. And then the hajj, they're doing it from themselves for your deceased Muslim grandparent or whatever it is. And, and the, the, the payment is for the hassle of him doing, going there. That's what you can intend. What's your opinion on Niaz? I never heard of it. Uh, Rai, read me something from Insta because I can't really open it up here. Shams al Ma'arif, if you come upon it, you have to burn it by Sharia. You have to you have to burn it. It's 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 the techniques of how to use Muslim jinn. They call it they try to call it white magic. It's very bad stuff. Nobody should be doing that stuff. It's haram. Many Andalusian people, says Muhammad Daniel, lost their Iman and Nesab. Many of them live in America and South America and they don't even know they had Muslim grandfathers that's totally true yeah any great grandfathers there's an epic poem called el cid that's why el cid is famous is it bad adab says lego man to lean against the wall in the jama khutbah very bad adab and if it was really up to me i would hire a security guard with a stick to poke everybody who leans against the wall i remember when you were in jama one day yeah and there was a guy sleeping on the wall yeah and then you were just like wake that man up <laughs> 
I got fell asleep in the middle of Jummah. Respect, respect, no respect to the Khatib. What else we got? Adnan Sayyid, we didn't really talk about it yesterday, but the man, subhanAllah, was freed, up, freed out of uh, jail after having been in jail for a long time. He was um, accused of killing a high school classmate of his, ended up going to jail, I think over 20 years. 20 years. All right, what was that one on Insta? Please clarify the video, Allah's will. Or oh, okay. So that um, video, I yes. If you're asking, is something Allah's will or is it my fault? It is both. Okay. It is Allah's will for this thing to happen through you. Allah willed it through you. So it is both. It is it is Allah's will that that the the bad thing occurred through you. Could have occurred in many other ways. So you have to ask yourself, well, what's the wisdom that this happened through me? Maybe to humble me, to teach me a lesson, etc., etc. Homeida X says, why do women have to wait to get remarried after their husband dies or divorce? It is one of the reasons is to make sure that the womb is absolutely empty. That's one, that's one reason. There's a hikmah and a illa, right? There's a difference between a wisdom and a legal purpose or a legal cause, or a illa. So the illa has to be there for the rule to be there. And the illa really should be, comes to us because Allah tells us, this is why, or the Prophet tells us, or the Muslims have a type of consensus on the illa. Otherwise, we do it, and we may not know all the reasons, and but we could point to the wisdoms. So some of the wisdoms is um, some one of the wisdoms is to ensure the emptiness of the womb. That's one of the wisdoms. And for that, many people to sort of realize because you know, see a woman with one husband, they see him with another husband, very quickly, question marks can come up. So also there's another wisdom, which is that. In that waiting period, the husband may change his mind about the divorce. So he divorced the woman. He has to wait now. Menstrual cycle. Next one. Next one. Next one. Okay? That's three months. He may change his mind. Just like you have engagement, right? Most people don't marry right away. You're like, okay, let's get to know this family. I get to know them. Let's discuss the major issues. Discuss the major issues. Discuss some more issues. Discuss some more secondary issues. We get along. Great. Let's get, do we just go get married right away? No. Usually you get engaged. All right. The engagement is basically, okay, we intend to marry each other. We discover each other in a little more. We get to know each other's families. Of course, you're not married, so you still have to follow all the rules of Sharia regarding that, each other. Then you get married. So what you ease into the thing. Allah Ta'ala does not like these shocks. This is not the sunnah. This is not like it for us. This quick, shocking behavior. No. Big changes right away like this. No. In terms of how we live. If those shocking things happen in the world, that's different. But for, like, for example, an earthquake could just happen. Yes, but in irregular behavior, we don't do things like this. Even... In intercourse itself, and there's no haya in the deen, so we're allowed to speak about these things. The Prophet said, uh, Quran says, Qaddimu li anfusikum. Qaddimu li anfusikum. Which means that begin with something uh, before you do that, right? Because it's a shock to the body, right? Your body isn't even ready for it. There's no lubricants until the two people come together a little bit for a few minutes in that which is less than intercourse of foreplay and then afterwards the body's ready to receive so in the same way that everything is goes slowly okay likewise divorce you exit it slowly you have a waiting period okay that's the concept that was some of the wisdoms of that concept
Makes sense. What else did you have, Ryan? Um, what's, what's the opinion on the Molid parade and marches? Is there any proof of this in our tradition? Be from the Quran or Sunnah or practice of the pious people? Well, the idea of marching, yes. The Prophet Sallallahu marched with Sayyidina Umar, Sayyidina Hamza after the conversion of Umar. And they marched through the city saying, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that concept is there. Uh, marching is permitted in Islam. To get people together and to walk somewhere is permitted. And whatever they say in it must be halal. At the very minimum, halal. If not, mandub. So to announce our Islam and to show everyone here, we're here, we're Muslims, we're doing this and that and the other. Uh, uh, provided that it's not like blocking roads and discourage, because you're not allowed to do that, right? You're not allowed to um, um, block roads and inconvenience people. That stuff aside, it is permissible to have a march and do remembrance of Allah, give speeches, talk about Islam, talk about justice, talk about all these other things. It's permissible to do all that stuff. And could be mandub. You can be rewarded for some of that action. So, so the march itself is neutral. What you do in it can earn you reward. It could also earn you sins. Muhammad Mun'am. The question is on um, masturbation. It is haram with ijma. Abdullah U.S. says many Ash'ari today say Ibn Qudama was a mus- mujassim speak against traditional Hanbali Aqeedah and those teaching today but the Hanabida were always excluded uh, when Ahl Sunnah was mentioned. Seems an opposite extreme to Saudi's Wahhabiyyah. So it's the opposite extreme of the Wahhabis. Um, I've never heard any Ahl Sunnah say anything bad about Ibn Qudama. And the Hanabila, their Aqidah, um, yes, there are some, there was some claims of Mujassima and Mushabbiha in the past, but there is a Hanbali Aqidah that is 110% valid. And we will release videos on that from Sheikh Yusuf bin Sadiq. We will release those videos soon. I mean, we haven't received them from him yet. But we will have them and they will be on art view so that people can know what is the Hanbali Aqidah. Do you know any sheikhs in Dubai? Neither shiuch nor pious people in Dubai. I don't Amar know. Any. Right huh? I think Amar is there right What's now. Amar doing in Dubai? Getting married? No, yeah, they're picking up his grandma or something. Oh, okay. Meet his grandma from Pakistan? I think so. Yeah, yeah they always meet there. When is it permissible to strike someone? You can strike someone when that person is about to do a greater harm so if somebody's about to like let's say drink or do drugs you can physically take it out of their hands that means that is if that person is your responsibility or that you can possibly do this for example for a friend if your friend is going astray and you see this yeah this is not it won't be considered like an attack or an assault because he knows you care about him or if it's your son or your daughter, and they're about to do something to harm their body or their deen. And it's expected that you can't put a hand on you can't touch them. Then you may do that. Otherwise, you may not do that. You cannot go to random strangers and touch them. Muslims in Oman, are they Ibadi? Yes, they are the Ibadi sect. And the opposite of Shia, basically. The op- complete polar opposite of the Shia. It's an innovation. It's a sect that is considered Ahli Bid'ah. What is the state of a Muslim who says, May Allah protect me from going to Hajj? The Fasiq, Ada, Lashes, what have you. Pick, take your pick. Who would say that? <laughs> what person would say that? Right? May Allah protect me from fulfilling Allah's obligations? They need their head checked. Yeah, they need their head checked. No doubt about that. What are the criteria that one has to fulfill to be able to go on Hajj? 
Well, it's it's the ta'a. That's it. Well, it's for your hajj to count as the hajj, which is an obligation, right? You have to reach bulugh. Okay? You have to reach bulugh. And you have to be hur, free. And because the hajj otherwise is nafila for you. Like the hajj of a child it is nafila for him. Extra reward. But he still owes hajjat al-islam, which they call it. Hajjat al-islam. So that that uh, that aside, bulugh aside, it's istita'a, which means you have the ability to go, you have the ability to come back, your your home and your family is safe when you leave. It's not like uh, there is there are some kind of violence that you would be exposing your family to that violence without any protector, or that your wealth would likely be stolen, or that you'd be raided on the road. So there has to be safety and finances there and back. And your family and your wealth have to be safe where you are. Or, for example, that if you leave your mother, who may be sick and have nobody to take care of her, and then she end up um, something bad happening to her, you'd be responsible for that. So you can't make hajj. Or we say we would say you're exempt from making hajj. Okay. Are there authentic, documented teachings? of Jafar al-Sadiq, the spiritual kind which he taught Abu Hanifa. First of all, I hate to burst the people's bubble, to be honest with you. But Sheikh Taha Karan, he has made it very clear in an article. Okay. Stating that they didn't have that relationship. Stating that the spiritual relationship that Jafar al-Sadiq had with anybody was with Imam Malik. And we do have certain statements from Imam Malik about Jafar al-Sadiq. And essentially that his ibadah was essentially Salah, Quran, Salah on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then... Um, there, but there's not much more beyond that. How many do we recite as salat al kamila? However you want, whatever much you want. Okay, there's no set number for that. Oh, but do a lot. Do a lot. There's a YouTube channel called Prince Amori where he teaches Shamsul Ma'arif. Wow. It should be shut down. It should be shut down. This is a, this is all about uh, getting uh, the powers of uh, dealing with jinns. Maz H says Niyaz is a few food distributed to people, especially poor people, with the intention of thawab. That's excellent. Okay, and they did donate that thawab to their loved ones. I'm so deflated by the posts I'm seeing about hijab burning and women shouting about freedom of choice. Well, if it's freedom of choice, then you can choose to wear hijab too. So. Psych Omar, it's my understanding that is impermissible to draw other people. It is, unless it is for a child and some like a child's cartoon or something or book or something and some have allowed and permitted that you may draw a person as long as it's not three dimensional and if you draw the whole person that is not three dimensional that's makru if you draw just a head so it's not three dimensional nor is it the whole body so that the person could be alive then that's permitted that is the ruling in the, the in the Madiki method what if, a, what if a kid wants to dress up for Halloween no we don't celebrate Halloween so no dress a kid can't wear like a Halloween jacket no we don't we don't celebrate Halloween it's a religious holiday mm-hmm. it's become like a satanic holiday although it started as a Christian holiday it's become like a satanic holiday but look it up, it is a religious holiday. It counts as a religious holiday. 
some people say, oh, how could you say that? Because, you know, so-and-so, him and his family go celebrate Halloween. I said, I don't but filter what the ruling is because some of my friends may do it. Okay, I, I might, some of my friends do a lot of sins. What can I tell you, right? What can I tell you? I'm just going to give you the answer of what the Sharia says. That's it. And if I have something that you're doing and another medhab permits it, I'll tell you that so you don't have to feel guilty. But uh, this thing where, oh, well, if so-and-so does it, so don't say that. I'm saying it, okay? He's still, he can still be my friend. He's Mubtala. Mubtala. He's tested with some sins. Well, I'm not tested with sins. Okay. Uh, R2D2 says, might be obvious, but what would you say are the building blocks for a society to look like a great Muslim civilization in the past? LaVon Brown, by the way, has given us a whole biography of Jack Sparrow. Because everyone loves Pirates of the Caribbean, Jack Sparrow. But his name was Jack Bird, and he was a pirate, and he became Muslim. I didn't know this. And married a Muslim from Spain. And he came to America, and he founded Coney Island and other settlements in New York City. Or in New York, he said. And he was against American slavery. And he was aggressive against those who traded in, in, in this. Ajib. Ajib. Never knew this history. Now back to the brother, establishing a Muslim so society or whatever. Uh, well, what, isn't a society start with, with the individual? And then that individual has a family. Okay. Then a whole bunch of other individuals do the same thing. And those family comes together and you have a village, a neighborhood. A bunch of neighborhoods, you have a town. A bunch of, a big town is a city. A bunch of cities, you have a country. It all starts with the fundamentals and the basics. That's why I have almost very little confidence in any of the top-down Dawah movements where let's get the Khilafah and then let's operate. Well, yeah, it would be nice to have a Khilafah, but you won't even be able to function if your whole society is against you. So you do have to, in a sense, look at the individual state of people. If you put a khilafa now in part of any part of the world, you're going to have a revolution except Afghanistan. The only people would respect it. Any part of the world, of the Islamic world, you said, okay, guess what? We'll wake up today, we got khilafa. They're going to revolt against it. Right? Things don't work like this. Things happen not... The Prophet Sallallahu came and Islam was already for 13 years before the Prophet came, arrived at Medina. They knew that there was something coming, right? It wasn't a big shock to them. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Mus'ab ibn Umair and they easily accepted his message, so many of them. At some point at the time the Prophet arrived, there's already more than 50% Muslims in Medina. And then they accepted it afterwards. So, I uh, much more am a believer. And then, by the way, physically, it's not possible. How are you going to physically take over a country? Right? So go take over a country and stop talking to me. I'm not going to be of any use to you. All right? So go take over a country. When you do successfully do that, I'll support you. Okay? But it's not, not even practical. What else we got? Anything from Insta? Okay. If a person dies never doing Hajj, despite having the ability to do so, and no one makes it up for him, can he enter Jannah? If Allah chooses to forgive him for that. Habib Omar has a hadith where one of the narrators is Sayyidina Jafar al-Sadiq, mashallah. I'm sure if we look, we can find his sayings in the books. I came across a hadith saying we must make up the missed fasts of loved ones. Maybe look at the Hanafi Madhab, but we don't have that. In the Maliki Madhab, all you can do for others who have passed away are al-ibadat al-maliyyah. Even reciting Quran and Fatiha and then saying, Isal al 
the only way the Malikia can do that is by borrowing from the Shafi'iyah. Why do they say this? Because this is something of the ghaib. What reward transfer is of the ghaib? And at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the only one that in which this happened was, uh, was Sadaqah. And Sahaba gave Sadaqah and intended it to their parents. And the Prophet told them to do that. This is in Bukhari. Shafi'it made a qiyas on that, but he stopped at certain things, such as Salah and Siyam. He extended it that Isad al-Thawab is possible. And the latter Madikis followed him in that. But I think you can check the Hanafis. They may say any ibadah as well. Okay? They may say any ibadah. Just check the Hanafites. Rashid al-Kabir, did you see a video of Habib Omar and Sheikh Mohsin? Yes, I did see that. Amazing. How does the... We're going to have to stop soon. Uh, fortunately, I have some res- duties. How does the, ob- does the obligation of following a madhab include lay people? No. Tulab al The lay person, he just follows his local imams. His parents and his local imams. That's how that's how the lay person operates. It's no it's not a good thing to be a lay person. You should be taught a bit. And when you know a lot of rulings and people respect the amount of knowledge of rulings they have, you become a faqih. You can teach the madhab at, in terms of the rulings of the madhab in ibadat and mu'amalat, you're a faqih. And then there's levels of fuqaha, big faqih, small faqih. Every, nope, there's no reason you shouldn't be a small faqih in 5-10 years. I read someone post Maham said that most religious people are those who don't speak about the religion but practice it with their actions. Well, who's, what's the source of the post? What if I said the most to that person, well, um, I heard that the most wise people are the people who don't post and keep their wisdom to themselves, right? So here you have someone talking about people who don't talk. I mean, Bushra Begum Niaz is when you say, if I do a certain thing and I pass a test, oh, then I'll give this amount of money. No, you shouldn't do that. You should not put conditions on your good deeds. But if after the fact, after the fact, something good happens to you and you want to do something good, that's fine. But you shouldn't say, if I pass, then I'll give has, uh, good, uh, I'll, I'll do some good deeds because that's as if putting conditions on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have relatives, Sophia says, of mine with no income who thought they would never go to Umrah or Hajj were invited so when Allah wills it, anyone can go. That's totally true. But usually that happens to those who have an intention. The Naqshabandiya goes through Sayyidina Jafar al-Sadiq. Allahu Akbar. Why? Because it goes through Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Right? And, Abu Bakr, and Sayyidina Jafar al-Sadiq is a descendant of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq in two ways. So it does make sense. Mm. Abu Maryam, all right, let me just give you one tip. It's a very simple um, thing. Everyone's going to have a different routine. Everyone's going to have a different way of doing things. But if you want to know some basic secrets... They're not even secrets. They're just the practices that are very good. Firstly is the ethic of not wasting time. It's an ethic. Like you should despise the idea of wasting time. And there are certain things, there is a time and place for wasting time, which is at the end of the day when you need to totally unwind yourself and deflate your head. That's accepted for us, right? We do have that, especially people with tons of responsibilities. Secondly, if you really want to have a great day, I'll tell you how the day is. If you, can, if you wake up in the fourth hour of the day, meaning like 4 a.m., 4.30 a.m., 4.45 a.m., 
that day is going to be an A+. Plus. If you wake up in the fifth hour of the day, so 5 a.m., 5.30, 5.45, that day is going to be an A. If you wake up in the sixth hour of the day, 6, a, 6 o'clock, 6.30, 6.45, that day is going to be a high, like a B plus or an A minus. If you wake up in the seventh hour, I would say that day will be a B plus or a B. You wake up in the eighth hour, it's a B. You wake up in the ninth, a low B. You wake up after that, just kiss the day goodbye. Only one exception of waking up at around 10 a.m., 9, though, that, that hour, is that if you had woken up for Fudge and stayed awake for two, three hours doing something, then we could say, yes, that, that is now, if you wake up at 10, because you did two, three hours of whatever you're doing, right? You're not lazy. You just need to sleep a little bit, right? So that's fine. But to sleep... And then wake up, and as many people do, just knock out a meaningless, you know, really weak fudge, which many people do, right? And many youth do just go, who knows if he's even awake, right? Make sure to keep the lights off. I don't want to wake up, okay? Go without an ikhlas and boom, knock it out like that with not much respect for Allah. And then sleep again until 10. Ikhlas, day's, day's finished. So that's basically, these are some basic. Um, and here's another thing that this is not from the dean, but this is just from personal, is it's not really great to do two things at once. Like, I'm going to do this. If I'm going to do this, I don't care. As, as long as the house is not burning down, don't even look at me, don't talk to me. I'm just going to finish this. Knock it off my checklist. I'll finish this. So, so single-mindedness in the work. But I, it's beautiful, the... Um, the, the ethic of making use of your time, waking up early. But if you wake up early, you also have to sleep early, right? What about shift workers? Shift workers, they have their own rules, to be honest with you. The shift work is so tough. For example, he's saying here, I sleep at 9 a.m. and wake up at 3, 4. There's no rules for you, to be honest with you. You're in a situation of, it's unique, right? Also, productivity has to do with, with distraction. Distraction and waste of time. So, distraction and, and, and letting yourself get bogged down. So, you always have to look at that aspect too. To, something is taking you off, away from yourself. That's why you should be as happy about what you decide not to do and as thoughtful about what you decide not to do as what you decide to do. This is very important too. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to, to leave, unfortunately. There are so many good questions that I want to take here. Okay. Benefits of having wudu, shaitan will not attack you. They will stay away from you. Allah will be with you. And you can receive the, the inspiration from Allah and his angels a lot more. Okay. I have to run. And inshallah, I will see you all on Monday. Support us at patreon.com backslash Safina Society and start taking classes at arcview.org. Jazakumullah khairan. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Shadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk. Wal asr. Inna al-insana lafi khusr. Illa al-ladhina amanu aminu al-salihat. Wa tawasaw bil-haq. Wa tawasaw bil-sabr. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.
Shiva.